Coming in at the second town, we have Bryn Shander. Bryn Shander is the biggest of all of them and is probably one of the most recognized. If you or any of your players have played Storm King's Thunder, you might recognize this little area. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of a story behind that, but I'm not going to get into that because that could potentially be spoilers for you. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into Bryn Shander. So while Bryn Shander is the biggest out of all these cities here, like it is geographically very large, we've got, you know, it's 2,800 feet, you know, in any direction. It's pretty freaking big. It's very condensed as well, you know, perfectly nice circle here. Like, man, that is almost as perfect as a circle as you can get geographically here. Pretty crazy. Um, but what's really nice is the fact that this place is more often than not the place that people are going to come from if they are coming from the south as the 10 trails leads up to Bryn Shander. That means that this place has seen a lot of trade and also important is the fact that Bryn Shander connects a lot of the towns to the west to towns to the east. So it makes sense that this place is the biggest, uh, but uh, if you definitely want to start your campaign in an area that's not as uh, dense, if you want your game to start off in an area where it's a little bit more isolated, but at the same time, you also want them to not be coming from these, or you don't want them to be from these civilization of Icewind Dale. You want them to be from the south. You are going to have to somehow work in the fact of, oh, maybe, you know, Bryn Shander is currently like, you know, closed off for whatever reason. And they have to, you know, basically go elsewhere with whatever group they're coming from. Bryn Shander, in a nutshell, is a 3 out of 3 on everything. 3 on friendliness, 3 on services, and 3 on comfort. And that makes sense because, of course, this is one of the more wealthier towns, and it's one of the more densely populated, coming in at 1,200 people. We've got uh, leaders, Speaker Duvessa Shane, who is, uh, you know, keeping the law and order around here. And we've got a sheriff running around the joint, Sheriff Markham Southwell. And once again, people you may recognize from Storm King's Thunder. Um, the militia is freaking huge of this place. They can muster up a militia of 250 soldiers and 20 veterans. Um, that's that's a sizable army. And uh, lastly, we have a, a heraldry here. Uh, the heraldry, of course, looks pretty dope. I'll go ahead and show off the heraldry here. Looking like some Game of Thrones stuff here with uh, these horns. And lastly, very important, is their sacrifice to Oriel is humanoid. Where other towns might just, you know, throw out some food or, you know, might go cold for a little bit. These people are holding a lottery and the poor, poor winner of this is going to basically be stripped of their clothes and tied to a post outside of town. And they're going to die. That is really terrifying. Even though these people should be, you know, civilized people, they should be up to the modern times, they are resorting to very barbaric acts of murdering people. And depending on the game that you're running, depending on the group's perspective on all of this and how the information is played out, you're going to have some people that may be sympathetic to this cause, but more often than not, you're going to have groups of people that say, man, this is horrible, screw all these people. And unless you do something to sway that, unless you present it as, oh, these are mandatory, like O'Reel herself has said this, unless you make it where the effect is noticeable that these sacrifices are doing something, your groups are probably going to try and stop this to some degree, or they're just not going to bother dealing with any of the cities that deal with sacrifice. So keep that in mind, that if you want your groups hanging around Bryn Shander, uh, you are going to have to, for some reason, explain that, hey, you know, this is a necessary evil. Because as per written in the book, it doesn't actually do anything. I would strongly recommend that you change that. Uh, next up, we have Overland Travel here. It does state that it takes a decent amount of time to get to the other places. Uh, specifically, the other big town of the Ten Towns, East Haven, takes seven and a half hours on foot. But hopefully your players are smart and or rich enough to hire a, uh, a dog sled crew or a uh, XB crew. And they can get there a little bit quicker. So you might be thinking... Bryn Shander, huge place, densely populated, tons of stuff, tons of trade. There should be a tons of information and tons of unique locations. Sadly, no. Uh, we do get three named locations here. We get Black Iron Blades, the House of the Morning Lord, and the North Look. Uh, but sadly, uh, not much other info on this can be found in this module. 
but it definitely leaves a lot to interpretation and it definitely can lead to a lot of one looking online to get a whole bunch of information or two just making it up yourself let's go ahead and dive right into these name locations shall we First up, we have Black Iron Blades, a combination shop and smithy owned by Garn the Hammer and Elza. Uh, what's interesting to note here is that they it states that they sell like the normal items as you'd find in the player's handbook and all that. But there is a little bit of a like little sentence here that says uh, they produce the cheapest blades around. So specifically, Garn the Hammer makes these crappy things. And there's even a joke told about helpless uh, commoners, or newcomers of Icewind Dale, uh, that often people meet their end and they were carrying a black iron blade to boot. Uh, there is not too much in the way of mechanics of weapon degradation in 5e. Uh, they definitely want to stay away from having to deal with that stuff. But if you are running a resource-heavy campaign where your players have to t keep track of all of the gear that they've got, if you're keeping track of all their their weight, if you want to have one of those games where there's a lot of emphasis on the loot that they have, I would strongly recommend that uh, if you buy blades here, they might be cheap, and maybe you can mark it down, you know, maybe they go, go for 5, 10, 15, 20 gold less than whatever the normal one is. But have it where the weapon does degrade over time, you know, after every battle, then you say, you know, there's a take marks down and then eventually the blade breaks at some point. And if a blade breaks, uh, you know, out in the middle of the tundra, that's miserable because <laughs> presumably they need to have more weapons. Uh, you can definitely add something fun to that should you desire. And next up we have House of the Morning Lord. The House of the Morning Lord is a location dedicated to the god Amanator. For those of you that are not lore nerds, Amanator basically used to be uh, this god named Lathander. Uh, Lathander being the newest version of this deity, Amanator being the older one. Uh, and there's a lot of bit of confusion in the world uh, how this god actually is, who this god actually is. Uh, if you want, you can definitely look up some good info on that. But basically, a lot of people get confused about this. And this one is dedicated to essentially the old version of the god. The interesting thing to know about this location is that there is currently a gnome residing there named Copper Knobberknocker. Uh, say that five times fast. Uh, what's interesting about this guy is that he is willing to say that a friend of his, Marcadius, is uh, doing some research at an old cabin. And that can lead your players to the Black Cabin in Chapter 2. Uh, the issue is, of course, if you don't have any religious characters in this campaign, why the frick would they show up to the House of the Morning Lord? Uh, yeah, so that's the issue. There, there's this nice little tie-in to the world, but unless you have religious characters, then why would they ever go here? I would strongly recommend that if you want to give your players some type of incentive of being here in the first place, then maybe you should say, oh, it's the House of the Morning Lord. I hear that place is warm, and maybe they'll go ahead and check it out. Uh, there's a lot of other fun little rumors you can seed into this of, oh, hey, that place is warm, but maybe they're doing something nefarious to keep it warm. Uh, when in reality, it's going to be just as cold as every other place, but they probably just say that to get people into the door. And lastly, for named locations in Brinchander, we have the North Look, uh, owned by a sellsword named Scramsax. Uh, really odd name. Probably not his real name, but, uh, you know, a lot of people come to the North and change their names because they're eluding something. Uh, this place is basically dedicated to adventures and vagabonds and, and all that stuff. So it attracts a rowdy crowd. Uh, definitely play into that, play into the whole people are drinking and, you know, being loud, obnoxious. One thing that's awesome about this location is the fact that there is a knucklehead trout that has been mounted along the wall named Old Bitey. So I'll go ahead and show a picture of that. And Old Bitey is got his name because apparently this fish that killed a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of people were getting murdered by this thing trying to fish out there and eventually someone was able to catch it uh, the person basically mounted on the wall and lo and behold a little while later some random wizard showed up and placed an enchantment on this thing and now it's like one of those bass uh, fish that sings here's a little song I wrote but this one is there's a place I like to go further up the weather, uh, river's flow. Where it is, I do not know. Must be under all that snow. Um, what sucks is, that sounds like it could be a really awesome like lead-in to something, right? Like It sounds like that should definitely be leading to somewhere. 
But sadly, it doesn't. This is just like some funny little thing. I would strongly recommend that you maybe add another little stanza to this, you know, little fishing song and have it tied to some location somewhere. Like it, it does say there's a place I like to go up the river's flow. Maybe there is some like waterfall way up the river somewhere where there is this wizard that basically like left all his loot there. It, there could be like so many things you could do if you just add like one more little sentence or two more sentences to this little stanza and that could lead your players on some wacky adventure that they got from a fish. You should definitely keep that in mind if you want to sow the seeds of adventure. Like all the towns in Ten Towns, they are given their own individual quest, which can either lead them running around town or sending them out into the wilderness to do something. This is no different. Uh, with this quest, we get foaming mugs. When your players arrive in town, they will eventually learn that there's a couple of dwarves that have arrived and they look really jacked up. The reason why these dwarves are jacked up is because they just got done running away from a yeti and uh, they sadly had to drop all of their loot uh, which they were bringing from Kelvin's Cairn. There is a gross little description on each one of these dwarves and how they are totally jacked up. You know, some are missing ears and fingers, some of them are just you know miserable and definitely one of them's got you know PTSD thousand mile stare and is uh, not really saying too much. The dwarves are going to ask the party to head back out into the wilderness to basically grab their sled, which is full of these iron ingots. And the reward for this simple task is extremely huge. They will be getting six gemstones that go for 50 GP each, and they will also be getting a discount at the local store. Really, really huge, especially early on if they don't have any gear, if you started them off with next to no funds they are probably going to have to hop on this quest purely out of necessity to survive. And uh, that's definitely one way to get your players out there is to make them an offer they cannot refuse. So your players agree and they head out into the wilderness to search for this sled. Uh, it actually does state that as they go out, they are going to get pummeled by a blizzard. And uh, definitely if this is their first encounter with a blizzard, that's going to be no fun. Uh, they're going to be having to deal with the environments. But eventually, after there are enough time, they will find the remains of the dwarf that was left behind. The details of this gruesome demise are disgusting, and if you have squeamish players, then I would strongly recommend that you stay away from this stuff. But if you have players that love hearing all that nasty stuff, then go ahead and tell them all about it. So your players find the dead body, but they don't find the iron ingots. What's up with that? Well, it just so happens that there was a band of goblins that happened to pass by, and they found the iron ingots. So they had the bright idea to go ahead and steal it. With a little bit of survival skills, your players will be able to follow the tracks and eventually catch up to the goblins and be able to find this. Once again, I just, man, I, I can't get over this art. Look at that. So we have a goblin cart that is being pulled by two polar bears, and that is like the most goblin-y cart I've ever seen. That's like almost Warhammer style, just like obnoxiously crazy, and I love it. What's really awesome about all the information that they have presented here about the goblins, it realizes that there are a lot of ways you can skin this encounter, right? There's a lot of ways your players can go ahead and interact with it. They could just simply walk up, see a goblin, kill a goblin, but they might try and negotiate. They might try and do some type of sneaky sabotage in regards of freeing the polar bears. They can do a ton of things. Uh, at lower levels, this encounter can be kind of scary because goblins, while they might not sound scary, they have a high AC, you know, 15 AC is no joke, meaning that for a lot of players, that's a 50-50 chance of just hitting someone. Really uh, not great. I would of course recommend that if your group does not handle combat too well, then you lower the amount of goblins there are or maybe give them some sort of disadvantage maybe have them too weak and tired after pushing this cart and say that they have disadvantage on some of their attacks and all that you can really flavor it up how they as well are dealing with the elements and the elements are wearing them down and maybe that'll also be a great hint for your players as well that hey if the elements are wearing these guys down maybe they'll start wearing us down too we actually also get a very cool little scenario here of 
If the fighting continues, then the goblin boss named Izobai, uh, she will go ahead and set the cart on fire if she knows that she's going to lose. And she's going to try and use that as an escape plan as presumably the group will deal more with the uh, iron than they will with the goblins. There isn't actually any rules specifically written on if the iron ingots melt or any of that stuff. It doesn't go into how much HP the cart has and all that. Uh, so if you definitely think that it's going to be a possibility that the cart will burn, you need to drum up some ideas on what's going to happen. Maybe say that the cart will totally be destroyed in a, you know 1d6 rounds after the fire started. Something very, very simple. Once your players have either negotiated their way into getting the iron ingots, fought their way into getting the iron ingots, or used some devilish trickery to use the polar bears against the goblins, they are able to get the cart and bring it back to Brinchander. And once they do, uh, it, it might take some time because they're, you know, pulling this heavy thing that weighs hundreds of pounds. My oh my is that juicy. Uh, all of that money just for them, and they also get a 10% discount at the Black Iron Blades. Uh, very, very big stuff. Uh, if, they, if you're going with the rule of, you know, you're going to make some of the weapons cheaper and thus worse then that definitely can key into, oh, hey, if these guys are willing to sell these goods at a ridiculously low price, maybe there's a reason why we shouldn't buy weapons that are that cheap. But uh, that's just me. So when all said and done, Bryn Shander is definitely a very unique location. It definitely should be played up a lot as there is a lot of stuff going on here. This is definitely the most uh, likely place for people to have come from the south. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, but you also need to realize that the book only gives us so much. You are going to have to dig deep or search around for more information on how you want to run this thing. Do you want the rituals to be regular? Do you want there to be an air of just uh, scaredness going around the town? People are frightened to interact with each other. Do you want to have it where everything seems nice and calm once people arrive? but then they can't wait for more people to join the city because they'll have more people in the lottery that can presumably die in their stead. There's a lot of ways you can run this, and uh, once again, can't recommend any one way. Your group is entirely your own. Coming in at town number three, we have Cara de Naval. Cara de Naval is named Cara de Naval because, lo and behold, there was this family named the Dynevs that created a castle or a care oh so long ago and there's a big old history on the thing and if you're one of those dms that loves just pouring exposition and lore and history on your players then feel free to go ahead and have some npc somewhere go ahead and drivel on about all how oh the place was attacked by orcs and then da -ba -da -ba -da. Uh, but if you are one of those dms and more importantly you have some of those players that don't care about that then you don't really need to read it too much into that. Uh, for Care Denevel in a nutshell, we have two on a friendliness, one on a services, and one on a comfort. So the people of this town are nice, it's just that they don't have really anything to give uh, passer buyers. This place is small, this place doesn't see too much travel, because the only other people that would be coming in around here are people that are coming to and from Care Conig, uh, which is very, very far away and not many people would go to. The population is 100 people, so very, very small, tight-knit community. For the town speaker, we have a one Kranic Seaver, who is basically known as a bully and uh, makes shouts to get his point across. But the interesting thing about this location is the fact that the speaker is currently not being seen, and that will play into the side quest for this town, which we will be getting to in a moment. For a town militia, it looks like they can drum up 25 soldiers and a two veterans, which quite honestly, if you can if you a quarter of your population is ready to, you know, fight, that's actually crazy. Like that's a huge portion of your population. Uh, but these pro people probably do see very hardy times and thus must always be prepared. For a coat of arms here, we have a castle on top of a red fish. Uh, this is symbolizing the town's vigilance, harbor and proud fishing tradition. Uh, but once again, if your players don't want to read into too much of the history, then uh, really not much to say about it. The town sacrifice to Oriel in this town is food, meaning that uh, a lot of times people go hungry, and going hungry sucks. It also notes that this town has rivalries with Kerr Connig and East Haven, 
which are coincidentally the two closest towns to this place. I would not want to be air cool rivals with people that are, you know, the closest things to civilization near me. But <laughs> I guess that's just how rivalries go. This town may be small, but it's not lacking in named locations. We have the Care, a place the name is after. It is a castle. It is currently the residence of the town speaker. But in addition to it being the residence of a town speaker, it's also the home of a cult. A cult has invaded the Care and is essentially holding the speaker at knife point and lets the cult uh, basically roam as they please. This cult is named the Knights of the Black Sword, and they are worshippers of Levistus, an evil devil who is totally not cool. Next up we have Dynev's Rest, which used to be an inn oh so long ago, but is now currently boarded up and uh, drafty, and has been out of business for years. While it is out of business, lo and behold, there is a population to it, as there is currently six Duragar, who are essentially using this place as a hideout and basically roam around invisible and come back and rest up here. And the reason why they're here is because they are waiting for when the dragon is going to be roaming around the towns and the Duragar are going to be popping up and supposedly slaying everyone else that the dragon doesn't get. Not mentioned in the page here, we have a ruined watchtower, which, uh, you know, it used to be a watchtower and lo and behold it crumbled. Uh, really not much to say about it other than for some reason it is named here. And lastly, the location your players are probably going to grow to know if they pass by here is the Uphill Climb, the inn of this town. And your players will come here and expecting some hot chatter and some spirits. Lo and behold though, Rourke, the owner of this establishment, is going to see that, hey, you know, some adventurers are coming by here. Maybe I can direct them to the care to see if they can suss out what's going on. Uh, so if the players go and try and find a place to stay, he's going to say, Oh, I'm all out of uh, rooms, but maybe you should try the care. And that is how they're going to try and uh, get adventurers to the care. The care is the side quest of this town. And unlike the other ones where it specifically states, Oh, so-and-so says that there is a quest. You should do this quest. There is nothing like that as a prompt for going to the care. Uh, the players might have been to Bremen where they met a woman whose son is now part of this cult. So they might know that. But if they don't, then there is actually no real reason to go out of their way for the side quest. Other than if they don't have a place to stay, uh, they are definitely going to try and shack up somewhere. And now on to the side quest, Black Swords. Once your players are prompted to go ahead and go to the care, uh, they'll go ahead and march right on up, and they might ask, hey, can we get in? The cultists there, who are posing as essentially guards, they are going to say, no, you know, uh, you can't come in here. Which, if you have lawful groups, they're not going to question it, like, right? Like, why would they? If, if some guards say, no, you can't come in, that's the end of that. Then they might just you know turn around and that's the end of it no no more side quest if they get absolutely no incentive and no prompt on what's going on here there is no reason why they're going to start bashing heads or charming people or doing all kinds of crazy stuff a lot of players need incentive to go out and do things so i strongly recommend that if you want your players to, to invade the care and deal with the matters at hand you basically play up the fact that, oh, hey, the speaker, you know, you know, he invited that one group to come in. And ever since then, you know, they, he hasn't been out much. He doesn't do any public meetings with anybody. Uh, every now and then I see people in the middle of the night make their way to the care and are let in. You know, let basically tiny little things add up. But not to where they should automatically know that they are cultists of Levistus, of course. You should make it that this group, the Knights of the Black Sword, make it seem like they are maybe some type of mercenary group that have kind of strong-armed their way in, essentially. We get a very nice and detailed backstory on all of the Knights of the Black Sword, and basically what it comes down to is all these people all have similar stories. They all, you know, were about to die in the frozen tundras, and lo and behold, Levistus came in at the last moment and spared their lives. Uh, doing so, uh, prom making sure that they worship Levistus, but also Levistus gives them all black ice uh, amulets. And these amulets, what they do is they turn everyone super duper evil. 
in regards of cult behavior and what the cult does, they will shun anybody away unless they do the following. Uh, one, one of the groups has a background or secret involving this, the runaway author. Uh, two, they found and killed the group of Duragar that is at Dynev's rest. Or three, the group involves in the affairs of Nildar Sunblight in uh, chapter two. Uh, we will be getting into all that crazy information in the future, but needless to say, uh, basically there is a whole bunch of Duragar running around and Nildar Sunblight is one of the sons of uh, the king of the Duragar that is located in Ice Window. If the group does any of these things, then lo and behold, the cult is going to act super friendly to them. The cult's going to play nice and, you know, keep up appearances, but uh, will, of course, terminate this if the group acts against the cult. Uh, we get a nice little list here. So we have this care in this town, and it's full of cultists, and if your group does something to appease these cultists, they are going to go ahead and invite them right on in. But if your group hasn't done any of these things and they think that something's fishy about the care, then they can go ahead and try and do some little sabotage and subterfuge and sneak on in. Uh, there is a lot of ways on approaching the care, and it is detailed out to some degree here. We have information on how they could get inside. They could potentially charm some people. They could steal some of the clothes. They could just go ahead and climb right on in. Uh, a lot of different ways on how they could approach this. But fortunately, unlike some of the side quests, we actually do get a very nice detailed map. And this map it goes into a lot of information about the cult's behavior and how they move around. And of course, all the named NPCs that they can come across. So let's go ahead and dive right into that map, shall we? Area C1, the main gate, basically details out how the main gate of this area, which is a double park cullis and uh, double sets of wooden doors, can easily protect this place from having people march their way inside. So unless your players do anything super duper crazy, they're more than likely not going to be able to bash their way through the front door. If they try to go through, then obviously the cultists are going to go ahead and shout and uh, get everyone involved. We get a nice two little sentences about what uh, some of the things that the guards might say if the adventurers try to make their way through. Uh, and those include Speaker Kranich Seaver is too sick to entertain guests. And Speaker Kranich Seaver has no need for your heathen rituals. And just those two sentences alone will definitely basically stop any, you know, good aligned people from probably making their way inside. If they have no reason to doubt that these guards are honestly acting in their speaker's best interest, then they probably don't have any reason to pry in. But if they've definitely been tipped off that there's something fishy going on here, or maybe they're demanding that they roll inside checks, or whatever the case may be, uh, they might learn that the place is a little sketch, and thus try and find another way in. Area C2, the snowy courtyard, we get a huge big old blurb that you get to tell your players, but uh, there is really nothing too fancy going on here other than it is just where presumably, you know, people go out in public. But lo and behold, it's so freaking cold, no one wants to hang out in public anymore. Area C3, the kennel and sled storage, is of course a kennel and sled storage where the sled dogs are being held. Uh, but what's interesting here is that there's a kennel boy in there. A eight-year-old Kalashite youth named Alasar Solmander. Uh, basically stowed away in here at some point and the cult is now using him to do menial chores. This boy can move around the castle uh, unimposed because everyone assumes that this boy is just doing some you know task told by somebody else. Uh, so if your group is doing something sneaky they can definitely have this boy running around and showing the players where to go and what to do. Area C4, the guard towers, are just that. They're just guard towers that let people uh, sit in there and uh, stay out of the cold as much as they can and allows them to uh, see outside in the world. The only interesting tower out of all of these is the Northwest Tower, which lo and behold has a secret door attached to it, which allow characters to go into Area C9. The thing about this secret door is that it's apparently not too secret, as the secret door is spotted automatically by any character who examines this section of the wall. Which, if it's not that much of a secret, then why is it called a secret? I don't know, just... Either, either make it a secret door or don't make it a secret door. That's all I'm saying. Area C5 on the second floor of the tower here, we have the armory. And the armory's got a pretty good haul here. We've got a rack of 20 spears and we've got six flasks of alchemist fire, which alchemist fire, if you don't know, is essentially like 
a little Molotov cocktail that you can throw that does a little bit of fire damage. And we also got eight longbows and eight quivers, and each quiver holds 50 arrows. Uh, for the loot hungry, that is massive because uh, longbows go for 50 gold, and if they decide to take all these and sell them somewhere else, they could presumably get a pretty decent haul. Uh, but something you should probably note is that the cultists would probably be privy to using this stuff, and you should definitely consider using that if there is some type of assault against the care. Have some of the uh, cultists using longbows, even if they're not great with it, even if they only get like a plus three to attack. Uh, you know, just have them have weapons that would make sense for defending a location because lo and behold, on roll 20 here, every single cultist is only armed with a scimitar. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense that, you know, if, if they know people are going to be attacking the place, why wouldn't they have people with bows on the walls? Area C6, we have the gatehouse, which of course allows people to uh, raise and lower the portcullises. Uh, but the interesting thing to note about here is that located here are two named cultists. We have Fel Supara and Huarwar Melfun. Uh, uh, Fel Supara, uh, totally probably newish name to most people, but is a tiefling, and she is responsible for dragging Huarwar Melfun away from Bremen and teaching him to be an evil cultist. Uh, it turns out that being an occultist has benefits because he gets a ton of HP and of course he gets all the stat blocks of a cult fanatic. So he kind of got really strong real quick. Um, but uh, the thing to consider is that cult fanatics are scary at low level. Extremely scary. Their plus to hit with their attacks is whatever, who cares. The real scary thing about them is that they have access to inflict wounds and hold a person. Inflict wounds on average does 15 HP, it's a 3d10 points of damage thing. So level 2 players are more than likely going to get knocked down if they get hit by this thing. Really scary stuff. And even more important, the fact that there's two of them and they're working together. If they want to fight, then one of them could just cold, cast hold person. And lo and behold, if someone's held, then you just walk up and bap them, they're dead. Like, that's really scary stuff. Um, so if you are running one of those high fatality games, then go ahead and keep those cult fanatics as is. But if you don't want your players getting killed left, right, and center, you are definitely going to have to nerf these cult fanatics. For Area C7, we're finally making our way inside of the main body of the cairn. We have the Great Hall. Uh, the Great Hall, once again, you get a nice little blurb of flavor text all about how to describe this place. Uh, but also important to note is that there is a servant, a 14-year-old tiefling a non combatant named Mare. Mare is scared out of her mind, and I would be too if I was 14 years old and got wrapped up in a cult. That would be miserable. Mare can be a wealth of information, as she could theoretically exposition a lot of what's going on around here. She knows that these people are, are tied to Levistus, and she also knows that there's an albino tiefling here who has made a lair in the cistern below the care. In Area C8, we have the Speaker's Den, which has a funny little blurb about one of the cultists named Thub. What a name, Thub. Uh, this cultist basically is dumb, but likes the authority that they are given when uh, they basically get to act on Kadroth orders. Kadroth, which we will be getting to in a moment, is basically the leader of this little cult here. Area C9, we got the Speaker's Office. This is where your players are going to find Kadroth, should they, you know, go very quiet and sneakily. Uh, but of course, if they cause any kind of commotion, and then I'm sure people are going to be moving around all the time. Kadroth, in fact, used to be the leader of this cult, but uh, because this albino tiefling named Avarice showed up, uh, she basically is way too powerful for Kadroth to handle and realizes this, and thus doesn't want to speak up against her. Uh, so he, he's just quietly doing his job. And his job is actually going pretty well. He's the mastermind behind uh, basically having the town speaker be a figurehead and keeping the townspeople happy. Something very important to note is the fact that Kadroth has a set of keys on him which is able to basically open up all of the doors in the care. So if people are going up to doors and you got no thieves in the party and no thieves tools in the party, then they're going to have to go to this guy to basically get everything done. In Area C10, we have the Servants' Quarters, which used to be the home of the Servants, of course, but lo and behold, the cultists came in and said, nah, we don't trust you, and moved them down to the cistern below. In Area 11, we have the Kitchen, and one of the few remaining people that is allowed uh, to walk around that isn't a cultist, 
and his name is Caro. Caro the chef is smart enough to not get involved in any of the cultist stuff and thus simply cooks the food and keeps his head down and doesn't want to get involved. Area 12, we have Kadroth's bedchamber. And the interesting thing to know about Kadroth's bedchamber up here on the second floor is that there is a cat named Touche, or Touch, Touchy. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. But um, there isn't anything at all, as far as I could tell, written about the relation between Kadroth and this cat. But I'm willing to bet that if he dragged this cat all the way here to this care, that he probably cares about this cat. So a group of sneaky people that made their way inside could theoretically, you know, have this cat and use it as a bargaining chip to get some information out of Kadroth. In Area 13, we have the Soothsayer's Room. Uh, very interesting here, uh, when your players make their way into this room, they're going to find this old woman who is basically like the portent of this cult group. Uh, she can see into the future sometimes and she basically divines certain things. She knows that she's going to die, and it just so happens that she's going to die right after she gives a huge exposition dump to your players. I've personally always hated this in every single movie and video game ever. The, the whole, oh, I'm, I'm going to die, so I'm going to tell you this, and then, ugh. Um, <laughs> I, that's just a personal peeve of mine. I'm sure some people are okay with that. Uh, but uh, she does give out a lot of information, and in fact, she gives out so much information that if you don't like the information that she gives, you should probably rework it. A lot of the information involves the Duragar uh, and the fact that they've got a fortress around here, and the fact that they are going to destroy 10 towns, and that they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. And more importantly, this is a lot of information, a huge amount of camp campaign information, which they theoretically could get really early in the campaign should they come here at an early level. Uh, so keep that in mind that if you don't want this much exposition thrown into the campaign this early, rework what she's going to be saying. Maybe reveal that she has seen that the Duragar are up to no good, uh, but maybe not necessarily that they are going to make a dragon and, and, you know, destroy the Ten Towns. Area 14, we finally have the Speaker's Bedchamber, where the Speaker is basically held up unless there is some paperwork to do. There is only a single cultist left in this room who is unceremoniously peeing as soon as the group arrives. Um, but if your players deal with the, uh, the captor in here, then they can actually talk to Kranich. And Kranich will basically say how he was duped and how these people used to be, or said that they were part of the council of speakers. And, um, and of course they came in and started killing all the people and took over. Uh, so there's a nice little more in bit of information dump here. But sadly, it doesn't really say what Kranich is going to do here other than it says Kranich won't be happy until he gets order back. And, um, and <laughs> so that pretty much he's pretty much saying, hey, uh, can you guys go ahead and uh, deal with the rest of the cult? There isn't any information on what uh, Kranich will do for the players should they do this. There isn't any reward or anything. But I'm willing to bet that if the party is coming in here and slaying all the cultists and freeing not only the servants but him as well, that he should definitely be giving something up here. Maybe at the bare minimum a forever free place to stay, if not more in regards of gold or possible item loot. Uh, but definitely consider that a no good deed should go unrewarded here. Area 15 is nothing to note at all. We have the old library, which essentially used to be a library, but hasn't been used ever since the orcs that took this over this place oh so long ago burned it down. With Area 16, we are finally going under the castle. And uh, with that being said, your players will basically only have one way to get down here, and that is through Area C4, which is up here, up by um, the, also funnily enough, the secret entrance, which is not so secret. When your players arrive down here, they're going to note two things immediately. One, there's a room to the immediate left, and two, that there is this like underground water area which can be accessed with a boat. If they go into the immediate area to the left, lo and behold, they'll find themselves in Area 17, Cold Storage, where, surprisingly, there's a whole bunch of bodies. They'll, be, they'll look in there and see a whole bunch of dead bodies, and these were the bodies of some cultists that were killed as they were taking over this place. Which makes you question, if this place where all of the bodies of the cultists were, then where are the bodies of all of the uh, guards? 
Well, in Area 18, the West Cistern is where they'll be able to get on a rowboat and start making their way down to the other rooms. But as they paddle, they'll be able to see that there is bodies that are resting in the water. And this is where all of the guards were. A pretty unceremonious way to uh, have your body displayed, I guess. There is only one rowboat here, and it states that the rowboat can only have two medium creatures in it. Which means that for most D&D groups, and presumably most groups are going to have more than just two PCs. Uh, that means that there is in fact going to be an issue with how you're going to travel here. Thankfully though they won't have to worry about too much in the way of Area 19, the storage, as the only thing that awaits them inside is a single rat. Uh, so hopefully two PCs can handle a single rat. <laughs> Area 20 is where they might definitely start needing more PCs as they will find the Shrine of Lovistus. The shrine itself is not technically deadly, but the real issue is the fact that there is a patch of brown mold behind it. And if anyone is dumb enough to touch this brown mold, lo and behold, they have to make a con saving throw or take 4d10 points of damage. Uh, that means that if they fail this DC 12 con save, they're on average going to take 22 points of damage. And 22 points of damage is easily going to knock down level 1 and level 2 players. And depending on the con and the class of the character, could easily hit and knock down level 3 characters. And that's just on an average roll. If you roll high, then lo and behold, you can knock down, a, theoretically, a barbarian. Uh, so definitely something to keep in mind that if your players are fixing to touch this brown mold and you're not vindictive, then you say, hey, uh, maybe you roll me an intelligence check to see if you know what that is. In Area 21, we have Avarice's Quarters. And for those of you out of the loop, Avarice is one of the Arcane Brotherhood. She is part of a cabal of mages that have come here and is in search for the lost city of Netheril. Uh, she, however, uh, is not that pleasant of a person, as one can expect, because she's working with a whole bunch of occultists. Uh, so she is bad news bears. And she is bad news bears more than just for the fact that her attitude is bad. It's more so to the fact that her stat block is gross. Any level 3, 4, and maybe even level 5 group is going to get the floor mopped with them. Uh, because she can cast a ton of spells, and she's got 84 HP, and she has got a Staff of Frost on her person. This is not a person that your group can be going up against at an early level, and thus really should not be presented as a villain that your players are going to be coming across. If your group is here on good terms, then maybe, yeah, Avarice is going to start talking to them. But if your group came here hacking and slashing all the cultists, and she knows about this, uh, she might be like wrapping up trying to pick up everything she can, and then have her teleport out of here, because this is not something that you just want to have your players turn a corner and then go up against a cone of cold, and then congratulations, the party's dead. Uh, definitely, you should have Avarice as a recurring villain, and maybe not necessarily a villain, but maybe an antagonist of the party. Uh, definitely have her... Basically, talk to the group a little bit, maybe some witty banter, and then have her teleport out. Uh, because one, just teleporting itself, you know, whether, whatever teleport spell she does, if it's like a dimension door or something, that is going to tell the players, hey, she can cast high level magic. Maybe we shouldn't be, you know, messing with her at all. Uh, definitely something to consider. Area 22, we have the Iron Lever, and this is going to let your players take that little rowboat and make their way to areas 23 and 24. In area 23, we have the East Cistern, which your players can, uh, once again, just as the, they're on the rowboat, make their way to area 24. And area 24 is where they find the prisoners. There is a reason why these prisoners haven't made any sort of escape yet. They've been locked behind uh, basically a door and also locked behind a the fact that none of them are going to be swimming out in frigid water. So uh, there's a reason why these people are kind of trapped here. Also, the fact that they're commoners and don't have any weapons, uh, so there is that. What's funny here is the fact that they are totally going to try and mount a prison break and thus going to jump whoever makes their way through the door first. They're going to basically just try and grapple and wrestle someone down. But uh, they're only commoners, so they only get to roll d20s and uh, add nothing to any ability check they do. Um, <laughs> so hopefully your players can handle that. But pending that, uh, hopefully there's more player characters in all this, and thus uh, they can negotiate, hey, you know, we're not here to mess with you at all. Unless, of course, they are here to mess with them. If they are part of the cult and are just exploring around, then 
they should probably, you know, keep up working with the cult and make sure that they don't do anything. And uh, for this quest, we get two little outcomes here. We get a Dark Alliance, which is, of course, if your players decide to, hey, you know, that Levistus guy sounds cool, let's join his cult and uh, make friends with these guys. And uh, they can actually make some long-term friends here, which could be pretty beneficial. Avarice is a powerful ally, and if they have her on their side, they can definitely uh, use that to their advantage and learn more information about the world and also have a just strong ally at all. And also the fact that there isn't only a cultist in this town, there's cultists in every single one of the towns uh, as it's written. There's no specific names for any of these people, but if your group is doing a lot more adventures and travels in the other towns, then definitely have at least one NPC out of the entire roster uh, probably dedicated to being a cultist of the uh, Knight of the Black Sword. The other outcome to this quest, of course, is your group routing the cultist, either killing them all or killing most of them. Uh, Avarice runs away uh, because presumably a low-level party can't deal with this. Um, but uh, it states here, of course, like the tiny little detail of, oh, the players can rest in the castle. But, but killing a whole bunch of cultists and maybe even losing a PC or two in the process because of all the fighting... Imagine doing all this hard work and all this labor and your only reward is, oh, hey, you can stay at the castle for free. That sucks. They need to get some type of, you know, physical thing. They need to get either some money or some loot, maybe even some food, maybe like a free dog sled or something. They need to get something because uh, screw that. <laughs> My closing thoughts on Cair de Naval is that this place is pretty unique. Uh, it definitely has a cool little quest tied behind it in regards of there is a cult and this cult is uh, spreading and there is, of course, some named NPCs that can be found uh, out from other locations in the world, such as Bremen. But the thing to really consider is, one, how are you going to get your players to go to the castle in the first place? And two... Even if they do go to the castle, are they going to have any incentive at all to try and break in or, you know, do anything of that nature? And, of course, the other thing to consider, too, is the fact that they might just group along with these cultists. If they, if the one, the cultist, you know, put up a face and the group doesn't suspect anything, then they might be working alongside a cult and they don't even know it. Or that you can go down the route of your group d does work alongside these cultists and they do know that they're evil, but they're okay with it. There's a lot of ways you can play this out and you really need to sit down and consider what is going to happen with your group and how you should run the game from here on out.